Um, other signs and symptoms, like I talked before, is the emotional symptoms where people can be more emotional, feel more irritable, feel more sad, feel more nervous. And finally, there's often sleep disturbances where people are sleeping more than usual, less than usual, having difficulty falling asleep, or even just having trouble staying asleep. Now, what are the risk factors for concussions? The number one risk factor for concussion is having a previous concussion. It could be anywhere from two to six times higher risk for, for staying another concussion with a history of a prior concussion. And it's actually important to know that there's always a chance that each concussion that you have may be progressively worse in terms of recovery where it becomes a more protracted course. Now, there's certain symptoms initially that occur, that occur excuse me, there's symptoms that are noted to predict a longer recovery. These are the greater number of symptoms and greater severity of the symptoms. In addition, uh, post-traumatic migraine, amnesia, or dizziness while on the field tend to predict a longer, longer course for recovery. Other risk factors for concussions, females tend to sustain more concussion than males in sports with similar rules. Um, this may or, not, may or not be true. It's been uh, suggested that maybe females are more likely to report than males, but in general, it is females that do suffer more concussions than males. Uh, age great, less than 18 tend to have prolonged recovery compared to adults. Um, in addition, some concussions are worse than others depending on what sport and position. Obviously, we said before that the higher impact sports tend to have more or worse concussions, but also this, the positions in, in sports where, where people are faster moving, such as in for football example, Defensive backs, linebackers, running backs, and wide receivers tend to sustain more concussions compared to, say, linemen. Uh, having a history of mood disorders or learning and attention deficit disorders tend to have a prolonged uh, course for concussions. And for some reason, a history of migraines also tend to complicate um, concussion recovery. Now, concussion management is broken down into four major parts. Number one, and probably far the most important is the physical rest. Rest. Whenever someone is diagnosed with concussion, the number one thing we recommend is rest. And this is rest from sport. This is rest from exercise. This is rest from any type of physical activity that really gets the heart racing. And this physical rest on most of the time continues until they are 100% asymptomatic. And I'll put an asterisk to that because that's not always the case 100% of the time. We'll, we'll get into that later. Um, as for cognitive rest, cognitive rest it has changed, the paradigm has changed for cognitive rest over the years. In the past, it used to have similar rules to physical rest where we would rest someone cognitively until they are completely asymptomatic. But these days, what we found is that that doesn't really predict a better recovery. What we find is the faster people get back to cognitive activity, actually the, the better predictor they are for recovery. At most, I personally would only give someone at maximum 48 hours of cognitive rest, then I try to get them back into what they can do in a graded fashion or at least with some sort of restrictions. And we'll again, get into that later. Sleep is very important for concussion management. We recommend anywhere from seven to nine hours of sleep with naps as needed. However, the naps should not interfere with the ability for someone to get their full seven to nine hours of overnight rest. And finally, we always recommend regular diet and hydration. Now, the majority of concussions get better within 14 days. These are, excuse me, the majority of sports-related concussions get better within 14 days or two weeks. And it can be up to three months for, non, for non-athletes or non-sports-related concussions. These are the um, falls, you know, to fall, traumatic falls or car accidents or, you know, uh, concussions related with um, violent activity. These tend to last longer, but for most sports-related concussions, the average recovery time is two weeks. And what you have to understand is that each concussion is unique. If an athlete has two concussions, the first concussion could take three months, the second con- concussion can take two days, and it vice versa. It, 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 it's just not predictable. You have to treat each concussion as a new special uh, event. Now, in terms of returning to learning, this is the cognitive recovery. Um, some school accommodations might be required during the period of cognitive recovery. And this is typically physician directed. So whenever I meet an athlete, I, if, if needed, I, I allow them with some accommodations. And of course we always want parental and counselor input, but 
these accommodations end up becoming visualized. And then as they recover, some of these accommodations start to fall off. Now, when can they return to sports? Number one, they have to be completely asymptomatic. Number two, they have to have a normal uh, physical exam. Number three, if any medications are started because of their concussions, they have to be off all new medications that were started because of the concussion. And we'll get into this, but if any neuropsychiatric testing is done, they must have baseline or normative data. So they have to at least be back to their baseline. Once all the above criteria are met, then they can begin the return to play protocol. Now, this is the return to play protocol. I believe that Kim or Josh is gonna get into this more uh, thoroughly. So I'm just gonna skip over this slide for now, but just know it's a six part return to play protocol with the first part being a completely no activity and the last part being uh, full return to play, which is basically a full game. Now, the neuropsychiatric uh, testing are these computerized tests which were developed as, for lack of a better term, the SAT for concussions. These tests test memory, they test reaction time. Um, the most common is the impact, which is in the, on the top left there. The other two are more used internationally, but these tests were widely used at one point to kind of have a baseline for people with concussions. Then after they suffer a concussion, you kind of use these repeat tests and compare it to baseline to see whether or not they are not, they have quote unquote recovered. Now, the neuropsychiatric testing, it, it's nice to have, but it really isn't mandatory. Now, the Zurich guidelines, which is an international meeting of concussion specialists, which kind of set forth a lot of protocols and advice for people, for, for physicians and practitioners about how to manage concussions. And, and to date, the Zurich guidelines say that the neuropsychiatric testing is not mandatory, but it can be helpful to grading recovery. In addition, the American uh, Medical Society of Sports Medicine also kind of stated the same thing, where most concussions can be managed probably without any type of neuropsychiatric testing. So the bottom line is these tests should not be the end all be all whether or not someone's recovered. They should be an aid to clinical decision making, but should not be the sole basis for a management decision. So just because someone has um, neuropsychiatric testing, I don't, we don't automatically just have take the test and see if they're recovery. It doesn't really work that way. Now, there are complications that can occur because of concussions. What we have we understand is the reason why we rest people after concussions because we know that during this state of uh, concussion, the, the brain is just very vulnerable to having another, to any type of trauma, which leads to something called the second impact syndrome where someone sustains a second impact, which worsens the cellular output of the neurotransmission, which leads to more cognitive defects. Um, and then what happens is this leads to excessive symptoms and leads to prolonged recovery. So that's why it's important that when we educate our athletes that if you think you have a concussion or you suspect someone has a concussion, you get you take them out immediately because you don't want them to have their second impact. And anecdotally, I had a player that I saw in the office where the player sustained a head impact. They knew something wasn't right. They stayed in the game. Later on, had a second impact near the end of the game, and now they're pretty much on their like six week of recovery. So they're well over the average time for um athletic sports-related concussion recovery. Now, I, I have to mention something called post-concussive syndrome. This is the category when some an athlete goes over that two-week course um, and you have at least three or more symptoms. At this point, if they are diagnosed with post-concussive system, they should refer, if they haven't been already referred to as a concussion specialist and they may need therapy, medications, or either, either imaging. And again, we'll talk more about imaging. Therapy can include vestibular therapy, uh, which works on balance, ocular therapy, which has to do with focus and eyes, your eye, your eye movement, so to speak. Psychological, which would help with mood disorders. And then something called sub-symptom threshold training. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure, Kim, Josh, you guys are gonna cover this? Okay, um, sub-symptom threshold training is, is, some, is, a, is where we kind of reintegrate physical activity, even though they're uh, still symptomatic, but it's, it's graded and they'll get more into it and why we do it. Uh, medications that can be used, we can use anti-inflammatories or Tylenol for any type of headache pain. There's been studies that show that certain vitamins and supplements have been known to help with uh, neurologic recovery. These can include B12 folic acid, um, the studies behind them are okay. They're not great, but 
the number one thing is they're not, the studies didn't show that some of these supplements are detrimental. So these are typically, these can be initiated when people are in that post-concussive state. Uh, for anyone with any type of issues with um, depression, anxiety, on occasion, we will initiate mood stabilizers, but this isn't very common. It's it, usually it's a special circumstance where we're gonna put in some of those antidepressants or mood stabilizing medications. Now, going back to imaging, uh, imaging for concussion can include MRI, CT scans, and x-rays. Now, if there is a loss of consciousness, normally people are taken to the emergency room and a CT scan is done routinely just to rule out any brain bleeds, but other uh, imaging such as MRIs can be used to use it brain tissue and brain parenchyma, but to date there's really insufficient evidence to recommend any routine clinical use of, of imaging of the brain to or even lab work for genetic markers to grade concussion recovery. Right now they're, they're, doing, they're doing a lot of research to see if it can be helpful down the road, but to date it's not routine that if someone's diagnosed with concussion that we get an MRI because we found it 99% of the time it's completely normal and, and not helpful for recovery. Now, I do want to mention chronic traumatic encephalopathy, that this is a potential long-term problem in all athletes. Now, chronic and traumatic encephalopathy, without getting too in-depth, is a progressive uh, telopathy. It's a big word, but it basically means that there's a lot of protein deposition in the brain, which can lead to a lot of dementia-like symptoms and also a lot of uh, emotional and depression-like symptoms. And we're still not sure why it happens yet. We're still trying to figure out, is it for people who get multiple concussions? Is it people who get a lot of hits, which are sub-concussive, but chronic and, and build up throughout the years? And unfortunately, the only way to diagnose CTE is on autopsy. Uh, we don't really have any imaging or lab tests to, to, to know whether or not someone um, has it unless it, until post-mortem. But what we do know is that the number one thing that we can do as practitioners is identify people who have concussions and help them recover right away and, and take them out of games if we need to. Now, in terms of what needs to be done for patients and athletes, it's important to be aware of the symptoms and seek care right away. And we stress always that don't try to play through symptoms because this will prolong recovery. The faster you rest, the faster you recover. And that should be ingrained and that should be a message that we do throughout this entire talk is that Identify your concussion, stop what you're doing, recover, and get back to play right away. Because again, with each system of concussion, the symptoms can last longer, and there may be a lower threshold for concussion. Now, the best, best treatment we have concussion is for prevention. You know, what we do know is there's no evidence that any type of special helmets or mouth guards per against concussion. All we can really teach is proper technique in their sport. For example, with football, we do... Um, recommend that people look and see what you're tackling. They, the NFL will put out the heads up program where they're encouraging people to look at what they, what they tackle. And finally, I just want to end with the Pennsylvania concussion law. This was effective, um, the Senate Bill 200 effective July 2012. I'm just going to read it to you. The PA Department of Health and Department of Education are required to develop and post guidelines and other materials to inform and educate students participating in or desiring to participate in athletic activity as well as their parents and coaches about the nature and risk of traumatic brain injury, including the risks associated with continuing to play or practice with concussion. This requires mandatory concussion training for all interscholastic coaches, awareness training for parents and athletes, and set some rules around written medical clearance before returning to play. Now, youth athletic leagues are encouraged but not required to play to follow SAC. Um, what's also included in this is that any child suspected of having concussion needs to be removed from the game and cannot be returned to the game until cleared by a medical, a suitable medical person. This can be, this is a physician, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, uh, in some states, chiropractors. So this protects the athlete and the coach from, from having to put someone in who may or may not have a concussion. If you suspect they have a concussion, you take them out and let, let us figure it out. All right. I think that's all I have for you. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. and go on mute. All right, thank you, Dr. Rosero. Um, give me one second and I'm gonna get my screen shared here.
All right, can everybody see that okay? All right, perfect. So um, thank you, Dr. Zero. that was great. Um, my name is Josh Kramer, and uh, as mentioned, I am the head athletic trainer at Germantown Academy. Um, so to follow up what Dr. Rosero was talking about, um, the first thing I wanna do is touch a little more on um, Pennsylvania state law, because it's important to understand, and a common question that I get all the time at Germantown Academy is, um, if you diagnose my child with a concussion, why do I have to see a physician? Or if they're already in therapy for PT, why do they have to come back to the athletic trainer? Um, so it's important to understand that Pennsylvania, this is completely state dependent. In Pennsylvania, it's defined as an appropriate medical professional and an appropriate medical professional is defined as any licensed physician who is trained in the evaluation and management of concussions or any licensed or certified healthcare professional trained in the evaluation and management of concussions and designated by that licensed physician. So this is where athletic trainers come into play and uh, physical therapists as well. And then it goes on to include psychologists who are neuropsychologically trained, um, et cetera. So when we're talking about the sports medicine team, um, it's important that this is a collaborative, um, a collaborative effort that includes the physician, the physical therapist, the athletic trainer, and the coach. And then most importantly, of course, the student athlete. Um, it's with this coordination that we can provide the best and most appropriate care to help get that student athlete safely back on the field. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the athletic trainer, in some cases, may be present at the time of injury, and when this happens, they can perform a sideline assessment and assist with getting the communication pathway started. Uh, they will also initiate that communication with the parent to get that initial rest for that first 24 to 48 hours going. Uh, the PT is then trained to handle the rehabilitation side of things if rehabilitation is required. And like Dr. Rosero was talking about earlier, there's different kinds. There's vestibular, which deals with balance issues and visual and psychological uh, and so on. So outside of the sports medicine team, what is the role of parents, coaches, and teammates? So when watching for potential concussions, the most important thing to remember is the three R's recognize, respond, and report. Recognize any signs and symptoms of a concussion, uh, and Dr. Rosero went over a bunch of these. Understand that most concussions occur without the loss of consciousness. Uh, signs and symptoms can occur immediately, but a lot of times they will start to develop or increase hours after, even maybe a day later after the initial trauma. Then respond. How do we respond? We want to take the athlete out of the game immediately. So if you're a coach, you see something happen or someone doesn't look right to you, yank them out of the game. If a teammate happens to see something and the coach didn't, this is where the teammate should say to the coach, hey, you know, Johnny took a hit. Uh, he Something doesn't look right. I think, you know, we need to get him out of the game. Don't leave that athlete alone. You know, keep an eye on them at all times. And lastly, report. We wanna make sure that the proper and appropriate medical professional is notified. Uh, this will include the athletic trainer, the physical therapist, and the physician. So when an injury occurs. So again, when in doubt, sit them out. This is a phrase that everybody should have ingrained into their head. We wanna to continue to like, just like we, I spoke about on the last side, we wanna to continue to um, focus on the three R's and keep an eye on any impact to the head, neck, or body. If the athlete appears dizzy or holding his or her head, they look confused, obviously if they lose consciousness, or, or if they can't recall any of the past events that just took place in the game, get them out of play. If you happen to notice any of the following where one pupil is larger than the other, you have a, a headache that's constant, persistent, um, and continues to get worse, slurred speech, repeated uh, vomiting, 
seizures, or any unusual behavior, these are all red flags. So these are issues where you want to just call 911 if there's not a medical professional around. If an AT is present, so if the athletic trainer is on the sideline or within near distance where they can be called to the field, the athletic trainer will perform a sideline exam. And this is, we're going to go over this a little bit more, but the sideline exam is important because it provides uh, a lot of information from the initial trauma that sometimes the athlete doesn't remember or can't relay that information um, accurately. So what does a sideline assessment look like? So there's a couple different tools. Um, the first is the SCAT-5, and I'm gonna go into more detail on this on the next slide. The SCAT-5 is the Sport Concussion Assessment Tool. Uh, some other tools are baseline tools, such as the ones that Dr. Rosero mentioned, like Impact or um, Axon, where we baseline at the beginning of the school year and then retest them after the injury to help make a diagnosis or to um, bring them back in the return to play process. And then lastly, the most important thing uh, is educating. It, make sure the parents, the student athlete, and the coach are all aware of what the next steps are. So for that first 24 to 48 hours, we're looking at complete rest. That means no physical activity, which is exercise or sports, and you know, no cognitive activity, you know, stay away from studying, um, stay away from any screen use, like playing video games or computers or cell phones. And then we do have a concussion pathway at NovaCare, and I'm gonna let Kim get into a, a little more detail about this. So this slide is what the SCAT-5 looks like. The SCAT-5 is broken down into five parts. And the first part is an immediate on-field assessment. So this part is only conducted at the time the injury takes place. And it, this, the, the first part of the SCAT-5 is broken down into five sections where we're looking for any red flags or observable signs. We're doing a quick memory assessment to see if the athlete can recall any of the previous events that just took place. Uh, the Glasgow Coma Scale, which is looking at basically their orientation and their alertness and a quick cervical spine assessment. If the person doesn't report or a coach doesn't bring an athlete to the athletic trainer at the time of the event, like if it happens at an away game and they don't have an athletic trainer there, then the next day or later that day when the assessment does take place, we bypass that first part of the SCAT and we go straight to part two. So part two is more of uh, background information. Here, we want to get a uh, basic concussion history. You know, how many concussions has the athlete suffered prior? Uh, are they taking any current medication? Do they have a history of any learning disabilities or diagnosed psychological or headache migraine disorders? As Dr. Zara mentioned, these can all be issues that affect the recovery timeline of a concussion. Uh, the other part of part two is the symptom checklist. So the symptom checklist is 22 symptoms, each graded from zero to six. Zero means that the symptom is not affecting the athlete at all. Six is the most severe. So we're looking at the total number of symptoms out of 22, and then we're looking at the symptom score, which is out of 132. So we're taking those 22 symptoms and multiplying it out by the rating of each symptom. Part three is a cognitive screening. So here we're looking at immediate memory tests and some concentration tests. Part four is a neurological and balance screening. And then part five is a delayed recall. So checking a little bit more of that long-term memory. Um, as I mentioned, if the athlete comes after the initial trauma occurs or the following day, the first part is bypass and we go straight to part two. Uh, and then the last part of the athletic trainer's assessment, and I'm going to let Kim go into a little bit more detail when she talks about her evaluation process, but the last part is called the vestibular ocular motor screening. And this is a quick five to 10 minute concussion screening tool. It's a tool that assesses both the vestibular, so the balance side of things, and the ocular motor system, so looking at eye movement. And we're looking for any impairments or increases in symptoms. 
Um, this slide is similar to the one Dr. Rosero showed. These are just some different baseline tests that are out there. Again, these are not tests that we use to diagnose a concussion. They just help in the process. Um, some of the neurocognitive or neuro um, psychiatric tests are impact, axon, uh, eye guide is a eye guide and reflection are both um, visual based, and then sway medical is uh, it's actually a um, smartphone or tablet based app that's used to test um, a couple of different things from reaction time, orientation, balance, etc. And then lastly, I want to touch on what Dr. Rosero was talking about earlier with the return process. So once they're cleared, once the uh, student athlete is cleared by the physician, there is a six step process to return to play. The first step is that initial 24 to 48 hours of rest or just no activity period. This pathway is normally performed by the athletic trainer or in some cases, the physical therapist. So when we look at this um, protocol, uh, you're gonna see um, a handful of variations out there they're all basically the same protocol, just worded a little differently. Um, so we're looking at the first day is light aerobic activity. We just want to get the heart rate pumping a little bit. We, we don't want to go above really 25 to 30 percent maximum heart rate. We just want light activity and we want to sustain it for about 25 to 30 minutes. If the student athlete makes it through stage one without a return or increase in any symptoms, then they would progress to stage two. If at any time the symptoms do occur, we immediately stop that stage and we wait 24 hours for the athlete to be symptom free. And then we repeat that stage. Uh, step stage two is um, moderate aerobic activity or in this case, sport specific exercise. So now we wanna get that heart rate up to about 50%, again, for about 25, 30 minutes. If they make it through that without any issues, they'll progress to stage three, which is a non-contact practice. And again, if they are symptom-free throughout that stage, they would progress to a full contact practice. And then ultimately they'd be cleared for a full return to play. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and let Kim take over. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Kim and while I am working on sharing my screen, there should be a poll question uh, coming up. Uh, yeah, coming up hopefully on your screen. And we just wanna see who's out there if you have suffered a concussion at some point. Um, and then to think about how did that concussion recovery go? Uh, did you recover within the average two weeks or did it take you a little bit longer? Um, let me get this screen up and share it. Okay. So as you know, we've mentioned before, so many concussions are happening out there and majority of them will get better on their own. Uh, you know, athletes within seven to 14 days and then even more within 21 days, almost 80% of people will recover independently. Um, and the question is, what are we doing for those people that don't recover independently or that take longer than your average uh, time to recover? So that's where uh, physical therapy can come in and working with the athletic trainers, the physicians, uh, we can help get you in here sooner and really take a good look at what aspects of your concussion are causing problems and develop a treatment plan from there. Oh, I didn't let go. There we go. So our program at NovaCare, um, We'll talk more about our baseline screening uh, program. That's one of the most important aspects uh, working with schools and athletes that we can do. Uh, the more information you have in the preseason and how someone is starting out before the injury, the better we're gonna be able to treat you after the injury. 
uh, it's also really important to have a comprehensive and complete concussion exam. If you're only talking about headaches or you're only talking about sleep, there's potential to miss other aspects of concussion, whether it's anxiety or emotions, neck pain. Uh, we want to make sure we're hitting all the aspects of what makes up a concussion and not just looking at, oh, my neck hurts and I have a headache. Uh, really important that we're talking to the athletic trainers, the coaches, um, and making sure everyone's on the same page. That's part of our program where we're in constant communication, whether it's with your athletic trainer, school administrators, even teachers, if there's, uh, you know, if people, if students need more help and support in the classroom. And our number one goal is to get athletes back on the field, back on the court, doing everything that you guys want to be doing. Ooh, wrong way. So our preseason baseline screening tool, um, as Josh mentioned, we use part of parts of the SCAT-5. So everything that Josh is doing after the injury, we're doing some of those things in the preseason. So we're gonna test your balance. Uh, if you have really bad balance before a concussion, it's not gonna be any better after. So it's important to know what your baseline is. We look at, like I said, balance. We'll take um, memory, cognitive and recall, and we'll do a symptom inventory, meaning just asking on that given day, what are you feeling? And if we're doing a bunch of high school athletes and any given day, an athlete can have a headache. Any given day, an athlete, a teenage athlete is gonna be tired or drowsy. Um, so it's important to have some of these baseline measurements so that after the injury, we know where this athlete is starting out at. And a big portion of our baseline screening tool is the VOMS or the vestibular ocular motor screen. Um, what this does, it looks at ocular movement. So we're not looking if you have 20-20 vision, but we're looking to see how your eyes are moving and how your brain processes that movement. Does it increase symptoms? Uh, does it make you dizzy or nauseous or any of those type of, of feelings? We'll also test balance with head movement. Um, it's all part of the screen. And again, really important to do this before you have the concussion because if moving your eyes back and forth makes you dizzy at baseline, it's definitely gonna make you dizzy after you have a concussion. So the more information we can have preseason, the better we can treat you after. Um, and as Dr. Rosero mentioned, impact and then those neuropsych tests, they're great to have, but it's only a small piece of the puzzle. So we developed this you know, baseline screening tool to give us a better picture in the preseason. And so the role of physical therapy, you know, we're here for those 20% of people that don't get better on their own, but we're also here for the people who, the athletes that have had concussions before and, you know, want to get back on the field faster. There's a ton of research coming out of University of Buffalo and Dr. Letty that has found uh, starting early exercise, and Dr. Rosario mentioned sub-symptom threshold exercise uh, within three days after the concussion is safe and effective. Now, most important is that absolute complete rest for the first 24 to 48 hours after a concussion. Your brain is in an energy crisis and the brain needs rest. But after the 48 hours, it's important to start gradual exercise, gradual you know, cognitive use, whether it's your phone, video games, but you don't want to push it too far where you have uh, increased symptoms. And that's where, you know, exercising under the guidance of a physical therapist who's trained in concussion management can be really helpful. So when you come into our office, you know, two days or however many days after a concussion, we wanna make sure that you had the appropriate rest. Um, and if you don't, that's okay. We're gonna do a complete exam and see where you're starting out at. On the next slide, you'll see, I'll talk about all the aspects of our exam. Um, and from that, every concussion is different. So some people might have more ocular motor issues. Some people might be dizzy all the time, but whatever we find in our exam, we'll create an individualized treatment program uh, for each patient. 
And most importantly, I tell all of my patients, we expect a full, complete recovery and return to sport, to anything that you were doing before. We know that a concussion is only a functional injury. There's no structural damage to your brain. And I tell all of my patients that on day one, because a concussion is not going to show up on a CAT scan, not going to show up on an MRI. It's a functional injury and we can fix function. So these are all the aspects uh, that we look at when examining a concussion. And this is any concussion, whether it's sports, car accident, slip and fall, doesn't matter. Um, the big three are really vestibular, ocular, and the physiologic aspects of concussion. Under the physiologic is, you know, a lot of headaches or sleep disturbances. And the physiologic category is where exercise is going to help um, the recovery piece. So uh, we first day, no matter what, we're going to get you on the treadmill or the bike, whatever's most comfortable for you to start exerting some energy. We want to get blood flow up to the brain and we use a, it's called the Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test to determine what the right amount of exercise is for you. We'll measure your heart rate um, and your perceived exertion and uh, symptoms while you're on the treadmill. And once the test is uh, complete, then we'll develop a treatment plan. And the recommendation at this time is 20 minutes of aerobic exercise every day. Um, but each person's going to be different. So it's a, we'll give you a heart rate threshold of where the right amount of exercise is. And most importantly, we want you to be sub-symptomatic. So the exercise that you're starting to do, you're not letting your symptoms go up really high. You're keeping them low or non-existent. Um, and then uh, another piece to touch on too is the anxiety and mood piece of concussion. Uh, it's an invisible injury. So especially teenagers going through this, sometimes it's really hard to for them to verbalize what's going on or what's happening because it's in their brain and they, they just can't get the words out. And on the surface, they look like they're totally fine, but on the inside, they feel terrible. Um, so sometimes it's really helpful to have just another person such as the physical therapist who can connect with the athletes and just dig a little deeper into what they're feeling and make sure that, um, you know, they're not going down a dark road or anything like that. And we can call a uh, call the appropriate uh, professionals to help with that. So as I mentioned, you know, our program, you want to make sure that you're getting a complete exam. Um, the research is really out there to support active rehabilitation versus just rest. The days of sitting in a dark room for, you know, two or three weeks, just waiting for it to get better are really long gone. Um, as long as you can do exercise and not increase your symptoms, that's how you're going to get better. And we really feel that, especially if it's your first or second concussion, exercising under the supervision of a medical professional is the safest way to go about it. Um, symptom provocation, so your symptoms increasing is expected and it's necessary to understand where your limits are. But if you are watching TV and you feel your headache creeping up and creeping up and going so far, and you just want to keep watching TV, it's not going to help your recovery. You have to step back. You have to take a break, go for a walk outside, go, you know, take a short nap if you need to, but then eventually go back to watching the movie and start over again. Um, that's going to aid in the recovery process. And at the end, our main goal is to, you know, help you return to life, activities, sports, um, completing everything that you want to do. And the most important thing to remember is when you have a, if you suspect a concussion, take them out of the game right away, because the sooner you do, the faster you'll be able to recover and the sooner you can get back to doing all these fun things. So I do have up here our sports injury uh, email address. If anyone has any questions or wants to set up um, a preseason baseline screening event for your team, um, you can certainly email uh, that address and we can get something set up. All of 
the, the program that we talked about today, it's offered in all of our high schools and middle schools that have an athletic trainer and universities that have a NovaCare athletic trainer. Um, but if this is a program that is of interest to you or your club sport, club team, um, certainly send us an email and we'd be happy to help. And that's all I have for you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kim. Great job. Thank you, Dr. Rosero and Josh. Um, I think that was a very comprehensive education to all of us on concussion management and how the sports medicine team works together to expedite the injury process. Um, we have a couple of questions that came in. I have a couple in the chat box and then I have a couple that I'll let you guys answer live. I'll be able to actually post them. So um, Mike Jeffers, uh, market manager for Novacare, asks for patients with more emotional deficits or prolonged recovery, when might you recommend working with a sports psychologist? Not sure who wants to take that question. I'll take it. Um, okay. Normally, um, I'm, it's, again, it's always case by case. You know, it's, it's never um, a hard and fast rule. But normally, at least if they're within outside the normal concussion um, recovery time of greater than two weeks and then when they're in a post-concussive symptom and it really seems like it's affecting their ability to recover, that's when I usually recommend a, a evaluation by a sports psychologist. Um, in addition, if someone has a history of uh, emotional or mood, um, uh, prehistory of mood or emotional issues, then it, it'd probably be better to get them involved sooner rather than later once that two week number hits. Um, another question I have from uh, somebody who actually couldn't make the call today, but um, works with a lot of concussions in Jenkintown for Abington friends um, asked, um, if you have a, a protocol, Dr. Rosero, for vision therapy. Do I have a personal protocol for vision therapy? Yeah. I don't, sure. I don't really have my own personal protocol for vision therapy. That's normally I refer to the, the specialist. When, when you, the most important part for me is identifying someone who does have a, a, an issue with vision, and then I get them to the appropriate person. Unfortunately, vision isn't my specialty, but my specialty is identifying people who do have vision issues. Sure. Um, I can speak to that uh, just a little bit. So, you know, in physical therapy, we are going to be doing some basic ocular motor exercises. Uh, you know, we'll work on near point convergence, meaning um, uh, has to do with depth, depth perception. Um, we'll work on saccades and smooth pursuit. These are all visual movements that the eyes need to be able to do. Um, so it is the basic, the basics of vision therapy. So if we see a patient um, that's not progressing well with our exercises um, in therapy, that's when we're making the call back to Dr. Rosero or, uh, and then reaching out for, um, you know, further vision therapy. And I'll give a little shout out to the uh, Edmonds group at Will's Eyes. They've been uh, our, our biggest resource for, for vision therapy in the Philadelphia area. Um, so he's my yeah, go Normally at that point, they need to see some sort of neuro-optometrist if they're, if they're having prolonged issues. Exactly. But a lot of the basics will be covered in, in physical therapy. And when we're, we're, work, we're doing the ocular motor exercises, but we're also doing the aerobic conditioning, we're doing vestibular exercises. So a lot of times, all the visual symptoms that people are feeling, those will start to resolve as we're kind of working the whole picture. Um, and then another one, how often do concussions lead to cervical dystonia? There's no specific statistic that, that shows that there's a direct correlation between cervical dystonia and concussions. Okay. Cervical dystonia is usually a, um, an issue with a cervical spine, in, excuse me, not a cervical uh, spinal cord injury, but usually some sort of just neck injury where you just get abnormal tone in the neck. Usually this can be uh, addressed in therapy normally, but in rare cases it might need some sort of medication or injection. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm gonna launch the questions that were put in the, in the chat boxes. So I don't know, I'm not sure exactly what this is gonna do, but... Um, <laughs> Um, you, you could just read them and then um, instead of 
okay. typing the answer just if you do um answered live just read just read them okay that's fine sorry i thought it would like show everybody okay um are so this question actually would be for josh so are all ga athletes um given uh an annual baseline um <clears throat> so it depends on what baseline tools you're using. Uh, up until a few years ago at GA, we were using the impact test. Impact recommends testing every other year. Um, however, this is incredibly hard to track. So we ended up doing our testing every year. Uh, about two years ago, we had moved away from impact and started using iGUIDE, which um, a little bit of what Kim was talking about a few minutes ago, um, tracks eye movement, uh, it mainly smooth pursuits. They're in the process of adding in saccades and your point convergence. Um, this is something that is a very quick test. It takes about 10 seconds per eye. So this is something we intended to do every year. However, with COVID this past year, we opted not using the tool. Um, and then this spring, we are um, piloting Sway Medical, which is the phone app that I was talking about. And this is a tool that if we continue to use this down the road, we would do um, every year because it's very simple. We just provide a code for each team. The athletes log in on their own device, do the test, which takes about 20 minutes total, and then they're done. Awesome, thank you. Um, so Katie asked, can I take medication, Tylenol or Advil while recovering from my concussion? Absolutely. It's, um, it's encouraged, especially if it's uh, interfering with your ability just to live your normal life. That being said, though, if you notice that these medications are not helping you, you really should contact your physician. Um, all right, and Joe asked, uh, with such a challenging year, especially involving organized sports restrictions and many schools providing all virtual education for a period of time, how has this last year been a challenge as far as finding baseline values, diagnosing concussions, or providing guidance on education and screen time? All right, well, I'll take some of that. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll take some that's of my a big, well, That's a big question. <laughs> so the challenging part uh, from it has, uh, diagnosed concussions for me hasn't changed, but what I've noticed is once sports came back, concussions came back. Um, one of the restrictions that I come, that commonly comes up is, you know, people note that looking at computers all the time is, is problematic. And Unfortunately, because a, a good amount of school has been virtual, it's been kind of hard to provide that accommodation. Um, I have recommended some anti-glare screens. Some, some, there's been studies that show that does help some people who have just have that issue with looking at screens for a long time. But I admit that it's been challenging from my point of view, trying to tell someone not to look at a computer when that's the only option they have. Um, but I'm, you know, I pray that, you know, as, we everything returns back to normal that won't be an issue anymore but in the short term it's, it's definitely been difficult for me yeah our our guidance like pretty much with any uh symptom management is we use the three-point rule so you know if you're looking at a screen which obviously you have to for school um if you feel your symptoms start to creep up and at three points zero is no symptoms 10 is the worst you've ever felt if you're starting the day with a two out of ten headache and you're on the screen and you feel your headache starting to creep up and up, once you get to that three points, you know, three points higher than where you started, then it's time to take a break. Um, and hopefully teachers, you know, are understanding and able to accommodate uh, those breaks and the break, just enough time to get your symptoms back down. And then you jump right back into what you were doing. Um, but using that three point rule is um, kind of our, our recommendation for symptom management when there's things that have to get done, but you just need to take breaks uh, during it. Yeah, and to follow up with that, um, the return to school process has obviously looked a little different this year. Um, traditionally, where, you know, that first 24 to 48 hours, you're in that resting period, um, and then we try to work you back, whether it's to a half day and then a full day or to a full day, but then taking breaks when you need. Um, in terms of virtual schooling, we've had to 
basically limit that um, return to a full day. So it's been maybe prolonged half days in front of a screen, or maybe you log on for one class in the morning, one class in the afternoon, and then the next day you log on for a different class until you can get accommodated to sitting in front of a screen for that full day period of time. Thanks, Josh. Um, all right, well, we are, we have one minute left in our hour. So if anybody has any last questions they'd like to post in the Q&A box, um, please do so now. And uh, otherwise we'll just get to closing remarks. And I think there is one more thing that popped in the chat. Um, it might be more of just how to make sure that kids are, and parents are finding a, uh, professional that's trained in concussion management. So um, Natalie, I think too, if you have a, a easier number to reach out to the Rothman doctors, um, we want to get you guys to, uh, you know, physicians who are trained in concussion management, not saying that your basic pediatrician doesn't, um, you know, know the correct guidelines, but the sooner you can get into uh, someone who's trained in concussion management, I think the quicker and better um, you know, you'll be able to manage your symptoms and really get on the right path. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I will just type in um, our direct phone number and our website in the chat box. If we can just leave it on for a minute or two, it just, I think it will be easier if everyone could just read it on there. Um, and I'll type that in now. <clears throat> All right, everyone. Well, I hope you all found this um, informative and interesting. Thank you so much for giving up part of your night to listen to Dr. Rosero from Rothman Orthopedic Institute, uh, Kim Wyand and Josh Kramer from NovaCare. Um, if anybody you know has suffered from or has an athlete or child who suffered from a concussion, um, you know, please make sure they get to the right person. Uh, Dr. Rosero is an excellent resource. Um, to have in, in Willow Grove and Doylestown. We're really lucky to have you here. Um, and, you know, obviously our, our NovaCare concussion team can see you on the back end when you're in recovery. So uh, again, Natalie put the, the phone number to schedule in, in the chat box, as well as her direct uh, email, if you need to set up an appointment. And thank you all so much for being a part of this webinar. And we're looking forward to a successful spring sports series. Thank you all. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. Have a great night, everyone.